success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, Road to Earth listeners. Today I have Marnie Schneider. Um, man, wow, she has a lot of different hats, a long history. So I'm really curious where we're all going to take this. But inspirational speaker, author, philanthropist, uh, family lineage, I guess, with the uh, with some NFL team. You know, I don't want to get too much into it. We're going to see where this goes. But thank you, Marnie, for being here today. Oh my gosh, thank you, Vinny. It's so fun to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, so I know you have so many hats. I know you do so many things. I mean, if someone doesn't know you, you're meeting someone out and about, I mean, how do you describe yourself? Well, I would describe myself first as a mother to three wonderful kids. That is my, uh, certainly they're my pride and joy. I would also describe myself as a um, very devoted daughter, my mother, Susan, and we'll discuss my mom's contributions to many different endeavors down, you know, later on in the show. But my mother, Susan, um, is uh, my best friend and also living with dementia and also living in the house with me and my children. So I am a devoted caregiver giver to my mom. And uh, I think that those are things that really do matter to me. I'm also somebody that um, is very involved in charitable endeavors, such as the Ronald McDonald House and Soldiers to Sidelines and the Humane Society. And then kind of the last thing that I would say to describe myself is I'm uh, a children's book author and I have a fan engagement company. So um, those are things that uh, there's a, a bunch of things that maybe we could talk about. And, you know, I have got wonderful friends and I'm very thankful. How, so how do you balance out the things you do? I mean, like, cause I've heard other people talk about it where they have so many uh, irons in the fire and it's like, okay, well I gotta, sometimes I, I do too much in the, the author stuff and then I kind of forget my family or sometimes I do too much in the philanthropy. I mean, how do you balance those things out? Well, I think that certainly I'm blessed with a, a, a um, and, a lot of energy. And that is something that kind of goes into my motivational speaking too, is that that is something that I take very seriously being in good health. And so I don't squander those things. I try to eat pretty well and get sleep and don't overdo it with drinking. Don't overdo it with um, anything, you know, bad habits of food and staying out late and whatever else and try not to be, um, fiscally irresponsible. So I think that like when you can kind of keep those things in check, then it does lend itself when you have discipline in those areas, which are are certainly difficult at times to control. But when you can do those things, then I think you can really have a um, an, an ability to, to do more things that are adding value versus um, taking away value. I think I heard, I think one of the videos you talked about, and we're going to wind a little bit, go to a, a young uh, Marnie, the um, but I think I you were a young woman, young adult, I guess, or young, I guess, young girl when your your dad and or was it your grandfather, right? He founded the the um the Eagles. Was it your grandfather? We owned the Philadelphia Eagles, and my grandfather was one of the original founders of the Ronald McDonald House Charities. Yes. Okay. And so, <clears throat> growing up in that kind of environment, especially with your mom too, she was the uh, general manager for a time too, right? Yes, my mom to this day still is the first female to ever be a general manager, vice president, and legal counsel of a professional football team. So it was, uh, I'm an only child. I have a, a great half brother, but um, from my, my dad's second marriage, but it was just me and my mom and my grandfather pretty much on the road doing those things. So uh, I had to kind of assimilate and adjust to what was going on and also find ways to not be bored because <laughs> kids can sometimes get bored doing things that sound so glamorous but there's a lot of downtime well wait so with your your family all entrenched into i mean nfl right and i course giving but entrenched in the nfl you were were you forced into liking the nfl or was it something that i just do this kind of thing i mean what was that what was it feeling like growing up in that environment um yes i I think that i when I was born, my grandfather had just purchased the Philadelphia Eagles. So I didn't really know anything else. And and I guess like I was taught football at a young age and I loved it. And what I love about football and I still do. And I talk about this when I go out and speak is that what I love about football is that 
you get four chances to get another four chances. So like, it's like life, like unless you really blow it in a 60 minute game or a game of life, you're going to get more chances. So you do your best. You certainly want to, you know, take the opportunity when you get the ball or when you're playing defense to either block the offense or go move the ball down the field. But if you don't get there, it's okay. You're probably going to get the ball back or have another chance to be on the field as defense and, and, you know, make the moves that you need to make. And so that's what I love about football. So did you think when you were younger that you wanted to go this route or was it something that, cause I mean, you probably have some, some generational wealth, family wealth. I mean, what's the, the, the one, what drives you to actually want to do something? I think that um, in my thirties, I, well, I mean, I've always wanted to do things. So when I graduated, yeah. I went to Penn State. I'd, I'd been around people that were highly motivated people, yeah. highly driven at the top of their game. So when you're with people that are professional football players, professional coaches or executives, you see people working at the highest level. So that certainly is something that I was very fortunate to be around. And then I went to college. I went to Penn State. And, and um, you know, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So I graduated and went to work for NFL Films and, and really enjoyed that and then moved out west and lived out in California. And I think that when I was in California, kind of farther away from my family, I was like, oh, maybe I don't really want to do much or whatever. And then um, I realized that like, that was boring. Like I had nothing to talk about and I had nothing, um, I had nothing to say to people. And I was like, I mean, I might be interesting, but I didn't like being introduced as like, I, what it really came down to Vinny was like, and certainly in LA, everybody does it like, oh, this is Marnie. She, you know, her grandfather owned the Philadelphia Eagles. Well, yeah, he did. But like, I wanted to have my own thing. Like, I didn't want to just be that Marnie. I wanted to be like, oh, this is Marnie. She's a children's book author and she's incredibly philanthropic. And she's got an amazing, incredible, you know, fan engagement company. And she's a public speaker. And aside from being a mom and all these other things, it's like, I want, oh, and her grandfather owned the Eagles. Like, I wanted that to kind of be the last thing. Yeah. People, as they introduced me, and they were kind of like qualifying me as a human, okay, which people do like, that's just how they do it. But I wanted the last thing to be about my family, what they did. And I wanted to really lead off with what I had been accomplishing. So I think that once I realized I was like, wait, I need to, um, I need to get back to like my roots of like what really, who I really am and doing things to make a difference. And then also, you know, if you want to be, um, if you want to be, philanthropic and you want to actually, you know, um, share your knowledge, you have to do things. And like, if you're not doing anything, then you're kind of like dead weight. Gotcha. So it, you, you're like almost starting out proving people wrong, kind of, kind of putting a, um, your own foundation, I mean, out there. I mean, so what, what were the thoughts? So you're, you're like, okay, I got, I, I want to prove everyone wrong. I'm going to actually do my own thing. Did it first come up with being an author or what like kind of popped in your head at that time? Well, you know, I, when I was younger and traveling around with my mom, my mom was a teacher before running the Philadelphia Eagles. So writing and reading were always huge parts of my routine. And when I would go to a different city for a football game, my mom was working. And so I would often um, get to travel around maybe and see that city, whether it was Kansas City or Denver or whatever. She wasn't going to take me, but we would have somebody from, you know, the, um, the other team or whatever be driving me around or doing this or doing that. And so, um, I would, I would write notes. I would write, you know, I would get back on the plane afterwards and I would write down in a journal. I was like, Oh, it was so cool. Cause we were in Atlanta and here's where we went and here's what we saw. We were at the time, you know, maybe when the chargers were in San Diego, like we went to SeaWorld and did these things. So I got to write about the stuff that I had, had seen. And also, uh, I was missing a lot of school. So my teachers kind of were like, well, if you're missing school, why don't you use it as a way to write about what you've seen? So we had all these journals of me traveling around. And about five years ago, my mom had said, I think we should take, and at that point, I we thought maybe something was going on with her. And that was the early signs of the dementia. And she said, let's take out Football Freddy and let's do something with it. And so I was like, okay. And then, but I didn't think that it was going to be 
anything maybe more than a hobby. Like, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs start things in their, in their garage or their basement and it's a hobby. And then suddenly you're like, wait, you know, I'm a mom and I, this is a, um, and I don't, I, I want to earn money and I want to be busy, but I, I can't go to an office, you know, 12 hours a day. Cause I've got three kids that need me to take them to school and sit in parking lots and wait for them and, and pick them up and do all these things and um, get them lunches and so forth and be the room mom. I love to be the room parent. So writing, um, I'm starting the first book, um, Football Freddy and Fumble the Dog Game Day in Philadelphia. We worked on that. And then um, in 2017 slash 18, that book came out kind of right at the right time. And um, Philadelphia just kept on winning. And then they ended up winning the Super Bowl. And so um, we had written a book about Philadelphia and it just not even about foot. It wasn't about football. It was about Philadelphia and some of the cool sites in Philly. And the book just sold a lot of books. People wanted it. And uh then we said, well, let's try another one. And so we've done eight so far and they've done really well. And now we're working on a, on a book for um, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So it's kind of like a dream come true in a lot of ways to get to write a book about Canton, Ohio, Football Freddy and Fumble the Dog Game Day in Canton. Here's Fumble, he's on my lap. Um, where there's not one team in Canton, there's 32. So that's what we, you know, so, um, so it's very exciting. I'm really looking forward to that book being out and everybody getting to kind of have a, an opportunity to tour Canton, Ohio, which is a great city, and then the Pro Football Hall of Fame as well. What are things that you learned writing the eighth book or, or writing the current book uh, that you didn't know writing the first book? Uh, I, I learned that, I mean, I've learned every time I write a, a new book, I mean, because it's like the same idea, basically. It's Football Freddy and Fumble the Dog. But then in every book, we bring in a new character and a new city. What I what I uh, I think I learned that um, it's it's good to have a formula. And that's what we've created with our books. But that even if you have a formula, you're still going to have to branch off and be and which is the fun part to be creative to use your brain to use the um the tools that you have to then add things in and to make it so that it's not like the formula is great but that it's not formulaic and that that's really kind of a science that i, I think we've been able to to do and and so those are some of the things and again like i'm learning in, in every book that i do about um what people want to maybe read about and how we're going to then market it. And so there's so many different things that go into that too. What's a, um, and what's a, cause I'm, I, on the books, do you actually say like the, the Philadelphia Eagles, do you say the actual sports teams or do they? We do. We, yeah. And there's certain rules that you can, that, um, you know, obviously licensing is a big thing, but yeah. there, we, there are certain things that you can do with um, published works that you can do where you can use um, the words, the likeness, you have to be very careful with likeness, but you can use the words. And, and so uh, you can, and, and part of it also is that these are my experiences. So this is my intellectual property. Like mm -hmm. I do get to see these places and I did get to travel around to them. So there's a little bit of, of, um, of nuance in that, in that uh, it, other people, wouldn't necessarily be able to do that perhaps in some way when they, um, but I have a little bit of flexibility to do it, but we're really careful with licensing and, you know, we want everybody, if there was a licensing, um, you know, we're, we're about to get our, our license from, from the NFL. And so, which we want to get, you know, we want to, yeah. we want people to get paid. Like I love when I can pay people because they've, you know, they're, they deserve it or they've earned it or whatever else. Like that's a good thing to be able to, to do that. And for them to, you know, licensing is a cool thing where they think they believe in you and you want to use them and it's a win-win. If there's like a, a business owner or someone looking to start a business that they're kind of thinking of licensing, I know you're not an attorney. I know anything like that. I mean, can you give us a ballpark of what kind of turnaround time that usually takes of trying to get in contact with someone? And I know you probably had connections, so maybe a little bit different, but do you know a time frame that usually takes? I mean, I think things, I think everything you have to allow yourself, like in business, what I would say is that it takes five years from like the idea to like potentially then all, then you do all the execution and then you even have the product. And then by the fifth year, you will know if it's a company or a business or a product or something that actually is valuable. So, however, 
you know, you can tell within the first year or so if there's some traction on it, but it takes about five years. And I think most um, executives and most business people will tell you it takes five years for something to start and then turn into something where it's valuable, saleable, where somebody else might say, I want to buy that company or you, you really have a, you've really created a solid business there. So within five years. Gotcha. But I think, I mean, that, but getting a license, that's part of it. That takes a couple of months, maybe six to eight months. Okay. You know, this, the, things can be very fast if, if you're, uh, and again, a, a lot of it has to do with the financial structure of the deal. If there's a lot of money involved, things tend to go a little bit faster. If there's less money, it might be a little bit longer. Well, jumping into like the, the Ronald McDonald, the philanthropy that you do out there. I mean, besides the books, I mean, now, how did how did that kind of evolve? Was it something just over time that you started kind of putting more on your shoulders or what happened there? So my grandfather, when he owned the Philadelphia Eagles, they opened up the very first Ronald McDonald house in 1974. So it's a charity that I've always known about. It's been very near and dear to my heart. And uh I've I've always been involved in the Ronald McDonald House. As I got older, I took more of a uh, of, of a bigger bigger um, part of being involved in different um, in different houses. When I've lived in Los Angeles, I was involved there. Moving here into the Carolinas, I you know, I knew that it was a great way for me to connect and be involved. And also, since my family was involved from the beginning, it would be very. Um, I talk about it a lot and I'm proud of it. So if I don't do a lot to help out, then that's kind of like a phony, that's phony. I don't like that. So for me, it was really important to take a really active role in the Ronald McDonald house and, and make sure that all the hard work that was done starting in 1974 with my grandfather and some of the other people at the Philadelphia Eagles and then the entire city of Philadelphia, everything that they did Kept, that I was continuing that tradition. And it's really important to me to be involved. I serve on the board. I, I've chaired our events. I, I, I really do whatever I can to really make a difference with the Ronald McDonald House, mostly because I know it really is very important to the families that are there. And my oldest son, who's a co-author with me on a few of my books, when he was nine months old, he was diagnosed with neuroblastoma, which is a neurological type tumor. And um, he did not walk or talk till he was almost five. And while we did not stay in a Ronald McDonald house, I definitely know what it's like to have a sick child, a very sick child, actually, incredibly sick. And so, um, and Jonathan's great now and healthy and, you know, a wonderful young man. Uh, so I know that when you have a sick child, you really can't think of anything else but your child. And so having a place to stay, having a place to, uh, you know, where you can go and meet other families that are going through it, being very convenient to the hospital really does make a huge difference in your life and in ultimately the, the goal of getting your child well. Makes sense. I mean, and then on the last like kind of one is the, the speaking. I mean, where, where are you usually speaking or where, what kind of events are you going to and what's the, the big topic that you kind of focus on? Well, I think discipline. I love to talk to you know anybody. I love to talk to anybody that wants me there. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I certainly am somebody that can educate people on the value of speaking sports because I always say it's the universal language. So whether it's going to a convention, talking to realtors, talking to business people about speaking sports. As, as a business person, if you can speak a little bit of sports, it will definitely connect the dots without a doubt. So you don't have to know everything about the team or the game or whatever it is, but you have to know a little bit about certain players or certain teams or certain cities, because I, I think that it's a great way to connect with your peers and with people that you're working with or for. So I, I love to educate people on the value of speaking sports. And I also love to then talk about some of the, the things that I've seen leaders do, which is have a lot of discipline. You know, I always say that you wake up and you get like a full cup of discipline. And if you've, uh, if you've used the full cup to get out of bed because you've had a, a big night out, that's fine. But if you do that all the time, you're going to have it's it, you're going to run out. Your cup is going to be very dry and you're not going to be able to do all the things that you want to do. So, you know, if you wake up and you've got a full cup of discipline because you've done some of the good things the night before, you've eaten well, you've taken care of your family, you've given back to the community, you've worked smart and hard and you haven't, you know, maybe overeaten and you haven't certainly done any drugs or drinking or excessive drinking or whatever, then you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, okay, I can really give back today. And the more it's a cycle, the more that you give back, 
the more that comes back to you. It just, it's just how it goes. It, it's not even, it really is the rules of the universe, but that's really how it goes. How long do you think it took you to kind of come to that realization? Oh, um, you know, I still every day, like I, I have a gratitude journal and I work on that every day. I, I think that I'm still working on it, but I, I, I probably, um, after my first job, I worked for NFL films and it was like, oh, this is so fun and I'm young and I'm traveling around. And, and, and then suddenly I was like, okay, I have to get up at 6 a.m. because we're doing interviews at 7.30 a.m. and I don't want to embarrass Steve Stable who I was working for. So I think that like probably in my mid twenties is when I really was like, okay, if you're gonna go and show up and be prepared, you know, you gotta have a good night's sleep and you've gotta do all the things the day before. And if you're not prepared, my grandfather would always say, don't show up because otherwise you're gonna look like a fool. So it's like, I didn't wanna look like a fool. So uh, I wanted to be prepared and I wanted to make sure that I was trying to do the right things and, and, and put and add value to the people that were making sacrifices for me. And so I knew that like, I got hired at NFL Films and other people didn't get hired. So I better do a great job, like a better job than anybody else because somebody, they picked me based on my family's recommendations. And that was a lot of responsibility. So suddenly I didn't want to be an embarrassment to my family. I wanted to be like, wow, she not only knows her stuff, but she's also bringing a tremendous amount to the table. And in order to do that consistently and comprehensively, you have to like have your full cup of discipline and go do it every day and just be consistent and comprehensive. You, you talked about kind of the, um, I guess the pressure, pressure on your shoulders, right? Of uh, building the legacy, your, your, your family put the recommendation out there for you. I mean, I'm curious, I mean, where that, that mindset came from, because I mean, there's that, that idea, right? That second generations have like a really high failure rate, right? Because maybe they don't take the same kind of mindset that you have uh, towards what you do. I mean, where do you think that that came from? Is that internally or is that kind of built in or? You know, it's interesting. And like, I love that question and I love thinking about it. Yes, it's definitely something that can be nurtured, but I, I do believe that it has to be, there has to be some of that in the genetic makeup of people. And I'm grateful that like, you know, I'm grateful, Vinny, that there's not, you know, we talk about this a lot. Like, I'm very thankful that some of the, the mental issues that a lot of people suffer from that that's not, I don't have that. It doesn't mean that I don't have down days. Cause of course I do. Cause I'm human. I'm not a robot, but like, I'm very thankful that some of the things that, that other people struggle with, like are not my struggles. Sure. And so that to me is a huge blessing. So I think that like, that does make it a little bit, um, a little bit easier for me in some ways because clinically I am healthy. And so I want to make sure that because I was blessed with that, that I don't squander it. And then I also know that I want to be a, a great example to my children and to my family. And so those are things that are really important to me. And I probably got that from my mom. I saw her and how hard she worked and the sacrifices that she made for me. And like that to me was something that was such a beautiful gift so while, yeah, there was a lot of time when she was not around and wasn't at my, you know, play school performances or picking me up from school or whatever, or wasn't home when I got home, I, I knew that the sacrifices that she was making were to make my life better. And so I didn't want to be like doing dumb shit, pardon my language, to like take her out of that. I wanted to be like, I'm going to be good and I'm going to do the things that I know are normal things to do. Like I'm still a teenage girl and want to have my friends over and, and do fun things, but I don't want to be disruptive to their day. It, it didn't ever seem appropriate. How, how do you, I mean, and I think people that maybe have a, a business and they're looking to pass on to their, uh, their kids. I mean, how do you instill that same mindset into your kids? You know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. So my oldest son, who was a cancer, is a cancer survivor. Um, he, everybody has their own path, and that's what's so cool is that you know he kind of during the COVID era, um, you know he was in college, and then everyone came home, and you know he he got his his um he finished up school, and he, but he it was it was not for him to go. You know he wanted to be more at home with me and 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 do some things there, and and he works two jobs. He's got a great job with. 
the sports company online, but he still lives at home. And, you know, and so it's like, you, you can't, everybody has their own path. He still lives here with, with me and he gets to spend a lot of time with my mom and his grandmother. So I think that like, but he's super motivated and also bartends and works at, you know, he's like a great, a great example of, you don't have to do the traditional Ivy league thing and go do that and then go to wall street. Like he's carving out his own niche and I love to watch him do his thing. And now he loves to tell me cause he's working two jobs. He's like, I'm working. I'm so busy. I'm, I'm like, Oh, it's great. Like, okay, okay. I'll stay away. Uh, and so then, so that's wonderful. And just watching how your children handle pressure and how they can manage and how they put their own discipline on themselves is, is really great. And then my daughter is in college and uh, she's a, it was a typical teenage girl and I wasn't really sure what was going to happen, but I, I, I had confidence that she was going to um, see, see the light and, and then say, okay, I, I don't want to, you know, be, um, uh, a dumbbell. I want to work hard and, you know, go to law school and all these things. And so she changed her major this year. She's a sophomore and she's pre-law and very focused and has an internship with the athletic department there, which she got all on her own. And I didn't, I didn't help her at all. She called me and said, Oh, I just got an internship. I was like, Oh wow. That's so great. And then, uh, and in fact, when I tell her things to do, she's like, I got this mom. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. All right, I won't say anything. Um, and then my youngest is a senior in high school, and uh, watching him, uh, you know, do his applications, and he was on the varsity football team. And even this year, he'd never played lacrosse, and he said, "You know, I think I'm going to play, try to play lacrosse this season." And I was like, "You've never played lacrosse?" And he was like, "Yeah, I, I know, I know. I've never. Thank you. I, I do know that." But uh, so he tried out for the team, the lacrosse team, and he. he practice a little bit over, you know, um, after football and he made the team and he, uh, he's not necessarily starting in every game, but he's definitely playing and getting in. And so I watch my kids kind of have their own path and their own thing. And it's very, uh, and it's very exciting to see them carve out their own niche and their own life. And, uh, me just being here to support them emotionally, certainly financially, cause I'm their mom and they're not independent yet, but knowing that they, that they are, um, getting to be more and more independent is something that is um, a beautiful gift as a, as a parent to watch your children uh, grow and, and spread their wings. So, uh, so it almost like a, allow them to kind of uh, go down their path, but if they go outside their path, then you kind of kick them back into oh, yeah. the right direction. Okay. So you have to have corrective action. You have to have discipline and you have yeah. to tell them, no, it's not okay. Like they know all day. I'm like, no drugs, no drinking, no drugs, no drinking, whatever, you know, be fiscally responsible. It's the same. I'm on repeat with that. Like that's always been the same thing. It hasn't ever been. And the past five years have been actually, very difficult for me emotionally because my mother who is my best friend who was my business partner when we started game day um got sick so suddenly now um you know some of the 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 things that grandparents do as a fun thing for their grandchildren my kids haven't had the ski trips that they used to have and they haven't had that because my mom's been sick and you know we've had to make make changes, you know, certainly having a family member who has dementia, it definitely is a, a um, it, it's something that I wanted my mom to live with us. And so I was going to figure out a way, you know, to make sure that from an economic point of view, that that, um, that that worked out. And I want her to have all the, everything that would make her life comfortable. But when you have a sick family member, it's definitely expensive. It doesn't matter where, you know, what, tax bracket you're in, you still have to make sure that, that there's enough to, for them to lead a long, you know, life with caregivers and doctors and things like that. And it's all a very expensive thing that, you know, um, that definitely changes, um, some of the kind of maybe the frivolous activities that we might've thought we were going to be doing with my mom as she got older. Now it's, it's different. And these are all good things because kids see that you have to be flexible and you have to adapt and you have to make sacrifices for family members. And these are great les lessons to learn. So while there's been, it's been difficult in a lot of ways, I think that it's given us a lot of opportunity to, to grow emotionally over the past couple of years. Thank you so much, Marnie. I got uh, one more question for you, but before I get there, if people are looking to stay up to date on what, what you're doing, what other platforms, things like that, what's the best way of them staying in contact with you? 
Well, they can um, reach out to you and you can connect them to me. Um, they can certainly go on Instagram and, and follow me on Instagram. It's Marnie Schneider one at Insta on Instagram, or they can go to Facebook or game day in the USA.com is our website and they can get the books there. They can learn about if they want me to come speak somewhere. Uh, I do whatever it is. I, certainly I, I do a lot of, I love to read to kids. I do a lot of online cl uh, classroom readings too, which I don't charge for those. Um, cause I love to do those. Uh, and so, and if they want to get involved in anything charitable, whether it's the Ronald McDonald house, the humane society or soldiers to sidelines, they can definitely um, also reach out to me on game day in the USA or on Instagram, or like I said, connect to you or find you on Facebook. And, and I, uh, I, I believe I'm, I'm pretty responsive or even LinkedIn, if that is the platform that they like to use. So for all those uh, teenage kids out there, I mo some schools, I think are doing it more now, right? Where they're requiring volunteer hours, I think, right? Yeah. Volunteering is such a great thing. You know, every time I've volunteered, I walk away feeling so invigorated. It's like, it's so much fun to volunteer because you know you're doing something good, whatever it is, whether it's volunteering at, at a local park and helping kids play sports or reading or going to the local animal shelters and helping out with the animals or, or making cookies for the families at the Ronald McDonald House. There are so many ways to volunteer. And, you know, if you're so inclined, although it's not really a volunteer position, uh, join the military. That is another great way to give back. I love our country. I'm very, you know, I, I, I think we have the best country in the world and going and, and being, you know, part of that, um, part of that group is something very good. My grandfather was in the military. I love supporting um, military based uh, charities. So those are things that really matter to me. I'll finish off with this last question. And it's I usually do kind of where we're going to be in five years from now. And I mean, because we've talked about legacy, legacy so much on this platform today, I'm curious about, have you ever thought what your legacy is going to be if, I mean, if you're not here with us anymore in 20, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, whatever that time frame is, have you ever thought about what you hope to leave as your legacy? Um, yeah, I definitely have. I hope that it would be a legacy of being a, a you know, a kind person who cared, who made people know that they're important and that they matter. Somebody who added value to groups that I was included in, somebody who made a difference uh, in the minds and hearts of people, somebody who crafted a successful, very successful business. As a businesswoman, it's very important for me to be very successful so that I can then find ways to give back the, the some of the resources that that I that I get. And I think that also being a, a very involved parent and being a devoted um, daughter to my mom, I think that those are things that I'm hopeful that people will say, wow, you know, she came from a, a very interesting background of, of family that, that certainly um, did interesting things, owning a football team. And my mom was you know, running the team and, and a lawyer and a businesswoman. And that um, she didn't just sit on her behind. She literally picked up the ball and, and ran with it too. And so those are things and encouraged her kids to do the same. That's great. Th thank you, Marnie, uh, so much for being here. I know we this was in the works for, for a little bit of time, but we made it happen. I appreciate you so much. If everyone listening right there, go in the show notes, go find Marnie, go find the book Game Day. And if it looks for the posters in the back, if you're watching us on YouTube, maybe one day there'll be a movie uh, about game day. You never know, right? Oh, look at that smile right there. I think that's something. <laughs> that's right. You know, definitely. Well, you know, getting to be a fan is such a great thing. So we always say that when you're a fan, which is why I love this, you know, the universal language of sports, because if you're a fan of whatever it is, of anything, being a fan of life is something cool, but being a fan of the game day experience, whatever it is, watching it on TV, playing sports with your friends, going out and talking about it with your friends, just being a fan is something that, that really does bring people together. And so that to me is something really important. And again, it it doesn't matter whether what politics you are, religion, anything, being a fan, we can all agree that being a fan is fun. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Thank you guys. Uh, please subscribe, please share, go in the show notes and go find Marty. Bye everyone. Thank you.